So let's bring you now to Washington, where last week it was China Week in Washington. And that is not that they were celebrating Mid-Autumn Moon Festival <laughs> or that they were, uh, you know, enjoying Chinese calligraphy and dumplings uh, at this time of year as one is wont to do. It was basically a gathering on Capitol Hill, various committees to kind of say – how crappy and terrible everything that China is doing. The House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, they convened a hearing specifically focused on great power competition in Africa. And so it featured uh, only one witness. Normally they have quite a few, but in this particular case, case it was only one. John Bass, who's the Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs. Here's what I'm going to do, Jeho, because I have a, a bunch of comments to get through. I just randomly picked some of the some of the comments, and just to give everybody a flavor of the type of discourse that was happening. Let me run through a bunch of these first, and then we'll get to your take on it. So first, we're going to hear the opening remarks from John Bass. Again, he's the Undersecretary of State uh, for Political Affairs at the State Department. The region, as you've noted, is also of acute interest to our strategic competitors who are coaxing or compelling African countries into trajectories of debt, negative growth, and exploitive security relationships. China has established a one-way trade relationship with Africa, dumping goods at below market prices, while the United States, in contrast, has for years promoted African exports to the United States through the African Growth and Opportunity Act. And the PRC is also working to expand its military presence and relationships in Africa. Let's now move on to Representative Michael McCall. He is from Texas. He's a Republican. And he's also chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. So he's a rather important guy. And he's also chairman of the Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party. So he's been a very outspoken critic of China going back now for a couple of years. And uh, this issue of Africa also caught his attention. We find ourselves amid a great power competition. The failure of leadership from the Biden-Harris administration has led to a world in chaos and a rise in adversaries around the globe, none more threatening than China. And the African continent is ground zero for the CCP with its manipulative Belt and Road Initiative crippling debt trap diplomacy. Keep in mind, many CCP-funded projects are dual use and can be used by China's military, including potential naval bases and strategic locations, such as their port <clears throat> in Djibouti. That question of security came up quite a bit in the hearings, and it's obviously the United States tends to think th a lot of things through that security prism and Republican representative from Michigan, John James, also addressed the concerns that he's got about China's role in Africa as it implies for American security. China continues to export its model of party over state authoritarianism, governance across the continent, and continues to pursue an Atlantic Ocean military base. Last week in Beijing at the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation Summit, President Xi Jinping pledged $51 billion in new financial commitments to the continent the majority of which will be loans that will enable Beijing to continue its strategy of debt trap diplomacy to gain leverage of African leaders and control over critical mineral supply chains. It is these crucial mistakes over security and supply chains, two things I know as a combat veteran and as a logistics, uh, as a logistician, that are most danger to our national security right here at home, not just on the African continent. The PRC continues to put export controls on critical minerals, most recently, Antimony. Anybody know what antimony is? Well, you should or you will. It's essential for our own munitions as we're running short on our own supply. This could starve our own industrial supply base of the resources we need in the event that we come into uh, direct conflict with our, with our adversaries. So let's just do a quick little fact check here along the way. I know we're going to do fact checking down the road, but number one, the $51 billion that we've talked about uh, ad nauseum on this show is not loans, uh, so very important there. Again, there is no public evidence that we know of or anybody else knows of that the Chinese are actively seeking a military base. This is on the west coast of Africa. This is something that the U.S. 
is convinced is happening. It may be happening in terms of discussions that are happening in various embassies, but there has been no movement on this issue for years, despite what we keep hearing coming out of both U.S. media and the U.S. Capitol in that respect. And so uh, just two, two factors. Now, just to point out that those were Republicans, this is a truly bipartisan issue. So let's take a listen now from Uh, Representative Ami Barra, who is a Democrat from Northern California, and you're not going to really hear much distinction in the tone and the rhetoric. I'm very concerned that we are losing ground in in Africa, um, not because of lack of regard, but, you know, when I look at, you know, surveys of Africa, China now is more popular than the United States. And when I think about how China approaches the, the continent, you know, I think the number... I've heard is for every dollar that they provide um, an investment, they saddle many of these low and middle income countries with $9 of debt. I was in Kenya last summer, saw a beautiful train from Nairobi to Mombasa. I had never actually saw any trains on there and I don't think anyone's using that train, but they're now saddled with a, 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 a real challenge. Okay, so just to be clear here that he was referencing the standard gauge railway that China financed and built. Last year, Giraud, passenger traffic on the SGR increased 18% to 2.73 million people. (laughs) So, or million passengers. So he didn't see any, but it's being used quite a bit. And, And again, what we see here is just a level of ignorance. And and again, it's hard to tell. Okay, so hold on, hold on, hold on. And we're going to get into this. We have this debate whether it's, you know, never assign conspiracy when mediocrity will do. Um, these guys have been saying this for a long time. This is nothing new. Um, it, it's really a reflection of the sclerotic nature of the U.S. political system that it's having a difficult time or an unwillingness to accept new information into the body politic. And the problem is, is that so much of what they were saying is simply not accurate. If African presidents and prime ministers were listening to this, which I know they're not because they are not going to subject themselves to the torture that I did by actually listening to the whole thing, they would, I think, have the same reaction that you do, that this is kind of a joke. Exactly. And it's... It's, it's just not serious. I'm just... I'm, I'm so tired. I'm so tired at this point. If it was a video recording that we're going to make, I, w- I was going to use this, this meme that we have on the internet with Jose Mourinho, just removing the headset. It's like, come on, let's stop this stupid question. Every comments they make, you had depth trap, uh, depth trap dip- diplomacy, depth trap narrative, all of it. But guys, did you fact check your own LM, your own? I mean, your own comments before making them. And I'm sorry, I do believe it's not ignorance. They are engaging in pure and active disinformation and misinformation. It's at this point, after so many years of availability of the data that's out there, engaging in those kind of conversation in 2024, September 2024. Now that's not ignorance anymore. That's pure disinformation. Okay. Come on. Because when you, you have the data in front of you and you keep on saying things like that, you're like, what are you trying to achieve here? Because as you said, people in Africa, when they listen to it, my friend, what are you talking about? What are you making up to here? And I mean, you, you didn't even use another soundbite, but similar comments were, were made about another representative saying something similar that teaching Africans about what they need to know about China. I was like, come on, guys, come on. Well, you heard that tone a little bit in John Bass's comments where he was saying they're coaxing African governments into debt. And I'm just trying to think, how do you coax a government into debt? I mean, it, what that implies is that the the African government who is sitting down across from the negotiating table doesn't really understand what they're doing. And the Chinese are manipulating them or kind of coaxing them into the, that word coaxing. Again, it's that paternalism that we continue to hear in the discourse coming from places like the State Department, which, you know, it's frustrating because you and I, we know a lot of very talented State Department diplomats. I mean, there are a lot of people who are there. The problem is, is that Guys like John Bass, who sit up at the very high levels of the State Department, are getting very bad information or, okay, okay, let me give you your side, or it's intentional. Now, 
I've been thinking a lot about this misinformation question quite a bit, and I was watching CNN this week. And, you know, obviously in the United States right now, there's this whole discussion about Haitian migrants in Middleton, Ohio, eating cats and dogs. And you think, how ridiculous is this? And then you start you, you start to kind of, what is the point here? Misinformation and disinformation now is absolutely a core part of our discourse domestically. And there was a discussion on CNN with... University of Virginia political scientist uh, professor Larry Sabato. Now, for those of you who don't follow U.S. American politics uh, that carefully, Larry Sabato, he's been around for decades. He's very, very famous. And he was asked to explain how is it that this disinformation continues to, to survive in the American discourse, even though it's been disproven over and over again. And it got me thinking about our discussions that we have about the debt trap. So I'd like to play some sound from Larry Sabato in this interview on CNN. And then I want to see if you also think that there's a parallel with the debt trap. We live partly because of Trump. We live in the post-factual era in which facts no longer matter, Fred. They don't matter. It's whatever you can say, whatever people want to take in, even if you present them with volumes of evidence that it isn't true or it was made up, it's okay because it serves a larger partisan purpose. It supports the candidate they want to win and uh, the end justifies the means. Boy, uh, we've uh, made a lot of progress in human history, but we haven't made any progress at all. So when I heard that, it really got me thinking about this question of the way that U.S. stakeholders talk about the Chinese in Africa as it relates to the debt trap and some of these issues of labor and things that have been debunked over and over again. And to your point, maybe the intention is the fact that it is not true. They know full well it's not true, but it serves a larger purpose, as Larry Sabato said. Definitely. It serves a larger purpose. It serves a larger agenda that they want to, they want to protect, they want to push. Because at this point, as I say, with so many data information out there, on the on data available on the first three research results that you make, you go on Google. Those are the top three results that you find. But you're still peddling those kind of narrative. No, there is a need of engaging, of entertaining, of maintaining, and then fueling a fake narrative. A fake narrative that many in the global south does, that started to use that stopped using it. But somehow in the US, there's still an active, I don't know, core of people who are really working into maintaining that alive and which I think it's really stupid because we've said it we said it a couple of couple of times already that from an African perspective when we hear you talking like this knowing exactly what's happened on the ground knowing really how what's up how we do things we just understand that you really don't care about the issue we just understand that now you guys don't want to find solution to any problem that we might have you just want to score points you just want to score political points and we don't take you seriously we come to you we're gonna ask, we're gonna be polite yes yes but you're gonna keep on doing what we need to do for our own interest and you're gonna keep on complaining but it doesn't make sense it won't it still it won't get you anywhere anyway so I really don't know if really they wanted to engage in a very fruitful uh, constructive discussion to say how are we going to engage with the Africa or whatever but definitely they are not on that path they're much more in the smearing campaign path and I think it's not really useful to even the US Africa relation it doesn't help at all now I'm going to put a disclaimer out here because and I don't know if anybody by this time in the show who disagrees with us is going to be continue to listen to us. <laughs> I want to make it abundantly clear that the United States is by no means alone in propagating disinformation and the Chinese are as active if not in many cases more active and we have a lot of evidence of Chinese engaging in mis and disinformation particularly as it relates to the Americans. Uh, This is now a tool of statecraft that a lot of governments are using. What we are doing here by critiquing the United States is that they position themselves as better than the Chinese, as above this. 
And the frustrating part is that when we see them engaging in the same level of discourse and using the same tactics, in many cases, as what Chinese have been doing on Twitter, on Facebook. And we, again, I know we're going to have a lot of people angry at us from both sides on this kind of, of topic. That's the way it is. OK, fine, whatever. But the fact is, is that, again, disinformation is a part of statecraft today. And, uh, you know, and that's but and so I don't want anybody to think that because we're criticizing the United States, we're kind of somehow saying the Chinese are pure and good and doing everything right. That is not at all what we're saying. The United States also has a, an extra burden because their hearings are open. We can hear what their representatives are saying. Exactly. We don't get to hear what Chinese representatives get to say. We don't get to hear what inside the National People's Congress, what they're saying. The same types of committees that are happening where they get to kind of think about these issues inside Xi Jinping's circle and what Wang Yi is doing. So the fact is that the United States invites more criticism because of its transparency in its political system. So I just I kind of want to put that out there. 